Hey everyone, Sorrow and Disney here, and uh, I'll just be totally upfront and honest with you right now. It's 10:21 p.m. on a Friday night, and uh, this is actually the video for Saturday. The reason why this is the video for Saturday is because I was able to get more hours on Saturday. I was getting off at five. Now I'm not getting off to 11, so I don't want to wake up any extra earlier than I have to, so I thought I'd shoot this video tonight and give it to you guys tomorrow, as well as, of course, the new Summer of Tarantino, which will be the Kill Bill saga, also goes up tomorrow. I'll have that up before I go to work tomorrow at noon. Actually, Molly, our fellow podcaster, Molly, is going to be picking me up at 11.30 tomorrow, so uh, yay, we're good with that. And it's funny because it's bookended, Popcaster Will who you know very well, is going to be uh, taking me uh, home tomorrow night. So that's going to be awesome. So uh, rides are taken care of, all that good stuff. Most likely going to see the Golden Arches tomorrow night too. So that's always a good thing. So um, I do the time travel thing all the time. Well, um, in this case, I kind of wanted to uh, throw you guys out front. Just put it on Front Street right now that this is video. It's being shot on Friday, but it's for Saturday. So um, the only reason I'm doing that is because I don't have time tomorrow to shoot out the video. So I wanted to get it to you. So technically, this is the Saturday video, even though it's being shot on Friday night. Also, unless something drastic happens between now and then, this is the last time you're going to see my face until at least Monday when we do the uh, Raw recap. So, um, I have one more Ben video in the can, and um, it's about his Ode to the Jaws Skippers, and I'll probably get that out to you guys very, very soon. Um, the Go Goal Bordello video, it's out, so you can check that out on Ben's playlist, and um, we do also have a... Uh, excuse me. We do also have... Will basically told me that he has an idea for a Will tutorial, and of course we're going to talk more Batman Arkham Origins, and uh, apparently there was some new uh, information announced about a multiplayer mode, so we're going to talk that probably on Monday, and you'll probably get that on Wednesday. And uh, the reason I say that is because this is a really, really packed week. So, I do want to say right now, um, I just looked at uh, my uh, secret source, and I'm not going to say what it is. And uh, we now have Byzantium, so uh, we don't need to see it in Athens. And um, Crystal Fairy actually comes out at the Athena Cinema next Friday. So we'll be watching Crystal Fairy and The Way Way Back. Add those reviews are going to be tacked on to the video next week, maybe? Uh, yeah, that sounds right. We're going to, Byzantium will probably be on the video with that's coming out later, th actually not later this week, that's coming out on Friday, which is a week from today, which will be the vi movies that just come out this week, which is We're the Millers, Percy Jackson, Sea of Monsters, or uh, Ten Cup, depending on uh, if you know the inside joke, and uh, also Elysium and Planes, so those will all be uh, watched and uh, those will all be talked about on AJ's Movie Reviews a week from today. So that's being taken care of. Summer of Tarantino next week is going to end up being really awesome. We're going to be talking about Grindhouse, actually. And more importantly, going to be talking about both Planet Terror and Death Proof. But obviously, most of this will be about Death Proof because it's not the summer of Robert Rodriguez. It's the summer of Quentin Tarantino. So obviously, we're going to talk about that. Had a blasty blast talking uh, Kill Bill today with AJ. And uh, that will be up tomorrow, or today, time travel, and that will be up on Pop, and of course, later this weekend, Sunday, we're going to put up the brand new verses, like I said, the cryptic comment is reality, and uh, props up to TJ, TJ that I work with, and he actually was the first person to guess what the uh, verses is this week, so uh, props to you, TJ, you get my uh, thumbs up award, so there you go, I don't have a smart cookie award like uh, Dr. Jimmy, but I will say... Give you a pat on the back, TJ, for uh, getting the uh, reality uh, cryptic comment. So, um, a lot of things going down right now. Um, been flipping my reservations back and forth. Found out reunion dates uh, on Sunday last week during the WDW Today Live podcast for the month of July. Uh, SummerSlam is in a couple of weeks. 
So uh, that's my segue, and that leads us to tonight's video, which we are going to be discussing this week's NXT and, of course, SmackDown, which, full disclosure, I just watched about 20 minutes ago. And the only reason I took so long to do it is because when AJ left, it was about, let's go with about 3.15-ish. So he left, and I cleaned the house. I swept the house, I mopped all the rooms, I dusted, I did my laundry, I did everything under the sun, so all that's taken care of now, and of course the lawn was mowed on a couple days ago, so we're good to go. So I did that, and then I listened to uh, Wrestling Reality with Justin Labar, and after that was done, I, uh, while well, having my lunch slash dinner, um, I didn't have dinner tonight because I was just, uh, I got to eat like a 4.35 o'clock-ish, so I didn't really have time to do it. I got time to watch the NXT, and then I uh, pretty much, 20 minutes later, SmackDown came on. I watched it live. I did the notes for it live, so uh, that's why you're getting the review tonight. That's another reason you're getting the review tonight. And thanks to Anthony Farley, I am getting the uh, NXT that was posted on the SNS Radio Network Facebook page. So, that's the reason why... All of you get to uh, hear about NXT from my perspective every single week here on Pop. So, let's talk about NXT. So, right away, Enzo Amore and uh, Big Cass, Colin Cassidy, come out. And uh, basically, they say that they're undefeated. Which is technically true. And basically saying they are not S-A-W-F-T or soft... I almost feel like grabbing my junk when I say that because it just feels like it feels right. So I mean, sideways hat, grabbing my junk, having a bunch of gaudy like jewelry around my neck, like kind of like Mr. T, but a lot gaudier than that, like bargain basement jewelry, like um maybe some sort of a medallion that says a number one D bag or something like that, or playa or all that stupid garbage. That's Enzo Amore comes off like a um. A real-life Guido. And uh, kind of like Enzo Amore and Colin Cassidy are basically, like I've said before, kind of like how Robbie E and Robbie T were in TNA when they were a tag team. So, basically, he says he's not seeing a wrestling ring. Oh, no, he sees a dance floor. That's what we're going to do. We're going to dance. So, Colin Cassidy gets in the ring, and he butchers the daylights out of Valare. So, he throws a little Dean Martin our way. And this is interrupted by tons of funk, who shows up to a huge pop from the crowd. Obviously, I'll say this right now, and we'll get into this when we get another couple of uh, cameos later on in the evening. This crowd at Full Sail loves the WWE superstars, whether they're face or heel, they don't care. I mean, one of the most over superstars in NXT, given the crowd reaction right now, Strangely enough, is Antonio Cesaro. We'll talk about that later on. I guess it, m it might have just been because he was facing Bo Dallas. That's another story altogether. So, tons of funk come out. And I gotta hand it to uh, Sweet Tea, Tensai, and uh, Brodus Clay. They're wearing, uh, they're promoting, they're wearing gray shirts to promote the new WWE Performance Center, also in Orlando. And um, basically, they're wearing also like blue track pants. So, they tear off the track pants. There's no pyro, given the fact it's NXT, and of course, we have a low ceiling at full sail. So, um, they come out, and we don't actually have a match. I wouldn't necessarily call this a match. It doesn't really get started. And um, Enzo Amore and Colin Cassidy, they powder to the outside. They're like, we don't want anything to deal with this. And then all of a sudden, the music hits, and Mason Ryan comes out. And of course, Enzo Amore and Colin Cassidy have both been having... Quite a fair share of matches with Mason Ryan over the past several weeks here on NXT. But, um, basically they're just doing that to coerce them into the ring. And pretty much what happens after that is double avalanche and a big time double splash on Colin Cassidy. And, um, Mason Ryan locks in a Shinanamaki or a Cobra Clutch, and it's a Cobra Clutch slam on Enzo Amore and plants him. Mason Ryan goes to leave. Tons of funk stop him. like, okay, we want you to dance too. So we get a very choreographed three-man dance group with Brodus Clay, Tensai, and Mason Ryan. So that's our first segment. Interesting. 
So, uh, Dusty Rhodes, of course, is the uh, commissioner of NXT. He comes out, and he's talking to the new NXT Women's Champion, Paige, as well as fan favorite, Emma. And the vivacious Summer Rae comes in, of course, to uh, interrupt the uh, little shindig that's going on. Emma basically mocks her, calls her a loser, and basically she says she can't dance anyway. And Summer Rae says, you mock the art of dance. And you know what? How about we have ourselves a little dance-off? As a matter of fact, how about we have ourselves a little dance battle next week on NXT? And basically, Dusty's like, that's one of the stupidest that I've ever heard in my life, brother. So, basically, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but still using the Dusty Lisp, so there you go. So, continuity, people. So, basically, what happens on this point is Dusty's like, this is stupid, but you know what? This isn't a bad idea. So, we're going to do this. Next week, it's going to be Summer Rae versus Emma in a dance battle. That's going to be really fun to try to write a review for, but oh, we'll figure it out later. So, Paige interrupts the little uh, conversation between the three and basically says, it doesn't matter who wins, whether it's Summer Rae, whether it's Emma, both of you will meet defeat at my hands. They're going. Paige is going to make both of them, regardless who wins, lose. So, get our next match of the evening, and it's also chronicling the uh, newly debuted Ashley Fleer, a.k.a. Charlotte, and she's taking on Sasha Banks in a big-time dropkick on uh, Charlotte, one, two, and a kick out, and the arm drag into an arm bar. Sasha's in firm control right now. Whip in and a springboard off the bottom rope into a giant tip up, ducks the clothesline with a split, and plants her with what's called a Charlotte's Web, which is basically a roll up with an inverted bridge, pretty much, that pins her shoulders to the canvas, but no, there's a two count only. There's a big time flare chop, how appropriate. And what I'd like to refer to as catfight slaps, it's basically like when two people that can't fight get into a fight, and they kind of like, ma, they kind of like slap each other like that. So that's what Sasha Banks basically did. That was her offense in the match. And uh, I like this. This is how it went. So big time slaps, wrist lock, into a springboard, into a wrist drag, one, two, and a kick out. So Camel Clutch is locked on by Sasha Banks, and it gets Front rolled into a pin, and one, two, and a kick out. Whip in, charges into the buckle, and she catches Charlotte with the shotgun knees, the double knees into the corner, and whip in, up and over, and clothesline, and she nails her single arm diamond dust and gets the pinfall. So Charlotte wins, and... Uh, Again, it's taken a little bit to grow on me. Charlotte, definitely not the, not even a third of the wrestling acumen of her father, but how is she supposed to be, obviously? She's got wrestling in her blood, so obviously I can't chide her for wanting to be in the business. But I can say that it's going to take a bit to get her used to, and I'll tell you right now, she needs to also have a little bit more than just gymnastics involved in the match. I get that. I get that she's a gymnast. It makes sense. She's flexible. I get that. But she looks like a reject from a fitness competition. She needs actual gear. But I understand she doesn't have to have gear if she is in the uh, women's division. But it would kind of help. That would make her not look like she was getting ready to place third in uh, Miss Minnesota. So, basically, yeah. Uh, or Miss North Carolina, depending on how you look at it from Flair's background. So, that is our next contest, and um, we lead into our next match, and we see the uh, <laughs> poor, poor team of Aiden English and Mickey Keegan, who basically got absolutely no offense in against the Ascension last week on NXT. They're getting absolutely zero offense in this match as well, as they go one-on-one -on -one against Luke Harper and Eric Rowan of the Wyatt family. So, since, of course, NXT has been taped... The uh, introduction of the Wyatt family is done the same way it's done on WWE programming. It's done with the, uh, we're here, and the Bray brings out the lantern, and he blows out the LCD lantern, and the lights go out, and the Wyatt family are in the ring, Rowan wearing the uh, sheep mask, of course, and Harper ready to fight. And pretty much what happens on this, the fans give them the biggest pop I have heard in that building yet. So, it's kind of like how the Impact Zone was, how you had probably maybe 1,200 people if uh, you stacked a couple on top and uh, 
we're not worried about fire codes and fire safety. I'll see that building again at Halloween Horror Nights this year. But, and I, who knows if I'm even recognize it. But, basically, from this perspective, you had a huge baby face reaction for Bray Wyatt and the Wyatt family. So, uh, basically, this match was nothing. Whip in, big avalanche on Aiden English, and the uh, lariat on Aiden English, and he gets planned with a big time splash from Rowan. One, two, three. So, Bray Wyatt gets in the ring. He picks up Aiden English, plants him with the kiss of death, and then Sister Abigail and leaves him laying. So the fans start chanting Bray Wyatt's name. They start chanting for the Wyatts. And I really wanted this promo, like, word for word verbatim. So thanks to the Bray Wyatt WWE Facebook page, I've got this specifically. So let's uh, go into this. I got something to say. There are several types of men in this world. There are men who dream and never make it off their couch. There are men who dream and fail. And then there are men who dream and change the landscape of this world. People like Bray Wyatt. But what about you, man? That's what I want to know. Aren't you tired of feeling unwanted? And this is like the gospel according to Bray. Like There's people like in the crowd going testify at this point, basically. Well, then today is your day. Because today is the day that Bray Wyatt decided he was going to change everything. Today is the day that hell froze. Today is the day that pigs fly. Today, me and my people looked at fear right in the eye and said... Mr. Fear, sir, you are a liar. And today I want you to go and I want you to tell all these so-called world leaders that they better heed my warning. Take notice to Bray Wyatt because today is the day that Bray Wyatt decided to bring down the machine. Today we say goodbye to NXT for now. But if you need me, I ain't hard to find. All you got to do is go, look up to the sky, and follow the buzzards. Oh, wait. And one more thing. Time is on my side. Follow the buzzards. And that was the end of the Wyatt family and NXT, and a fitting end to Bray Wyatt, Eric Rowan, and Luke Harper as an entity in NXT. And going forward, they will be missed, obviously, but they weren't necessarily replaced, but somebody wanted to step up as they were stepping down. So we'll talk about that in a second, actually. Oh, yeah, for the second week, Mickey Keegan gets to warm the apron. Yay, Mickey Keegan must love his job right now. Storyline perspective, of course. So we get a matchup between Corey Graves, one half of the NXT Tag Team Champions, and uh, Scott Dawson, of course, with Sylvester Lafont. So um, I'll be totally honest with you. I thought this match would go a lot longer than it did. So I didn't really write that many uh, notes for it. So I'm just going to go right to the finish. So Dawson jumps him and works him over for quite a while. Um... Goes for a clothesline, Graves ducks it, and he does that diving clip to the knee, and it pretty much sets up Lucky 13, and as soon as he gets it on, he ta Dawson taps. That's the end of the match. But that's not the end of this match. That's the end of the wrestling part of this match, but it's totally not the end of the segment. Because in the corner of Corey Graves during this match was his NXT Tag Team Championship partner, Adrian Neville, of course. Neville, of course, is basically out there. It's kind of a funny bit of editing. Because with the Wyatt family saying goodbye, which was totally pretty much no-sold as a babyface moment by the NXT commentators, which made complete sense, obviously, because you're not trying to put that over. Not trying to put them over as babyfaces going out. That makes sense to me completely. But you have the tag team champions that are out, and you have a little vignette between them before this match happens. And I know I'm going out of order, but uh, that's pretty much how it works here. So I'm just trying to say this to a point. Basically, what happened was they're talking back and forth, and 
you know, Adrian Neville's kind of like, I want to be a good tag team partner, and you never know if the Wyatt family are going to want revenge. So I want to be at ringside. This was, of course, right after the Wyatt family said they were leaving the company. Yeah, great editing right there. Uh, that was kind of a snafu by WWE. I'll say that right now. So, um, basically, I'm um and basically are pretty much like, it's like a drinking game when we have these videos. I don't know why, it's just how it works. So we have Adrian Neville at ringside with his tag team championship partner. So Neville's at ringside, Dawson gets pinned, sorry, Dawson submits to the Lucky 13 submission, and we hear the music of a very familiar faction. That's right. NXT welcomes back the return of The Shield. So The Shield come back, and they don't come through the crowd, obviously, because there's no way to do this at full sale. I mean, I guess there's a way to do this, but I guess you'd have to come through the side door. But I don't know how the building is set up, so I don't think that's possible. They can't come through the crowd, obviously, because of the low ceiling. So, they come through the entranceway, which is something you don't do in WWE, obviously, because they come through the crowd, because it's a giant crowd normally. Well... Basically what happens on this is they're both have Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins have the WWE Tag Team Championship. WWE Tag Team Championships. I don't know why I just made that so elongated of a sentence, but oh well, that's how it works. And Dean Ambrose, of course, has the United States title. So, basically, the Shield has returned. And Seth Rollins makes it be known that the Shield is back. Adrian Neville, listen up. This is the words of Dean Ambrose. It's like, you're not a champion. You just slid into Cassius Ono's spot. Ooh, sick burn. <laughs> and a shoot. You're a crook. And to us, that's an injustice. An injustice that's punished by the law of the shield. So, we're going to give you your shot. Your golden opportunity. We're making the challenge to you. Next week, Adrian Neville, you face me, Dean Ambrose. And, of course... I will deal out the justice that you deserve, being the crook that you are. So, Adrian Neville thinks about it and goes, Okay, I'll accept your challenge, but under one condition. How about you put on put the United States Championship on the line? Ambrose thinks about it for a split second and pretty much says, Okay. But Neville is a little overzealous and he wants the match right here, right now. Ambrose is like, Okay, you got your match, but next week. You're not talking to some NXT rookie. You're talking to the United States champion, the most important singles champion in the business today. These are Ambrose's words. But we'll do this on my terms, and we'll do this next week. So Adrian Neville gets on the mic and says, Dean, next week, justice will finally be served. Believe in that. So next week, we get... Dean Ambrose putting the United States title on the line against Adrian Neville. That's going to be really good. Really good. So we get our main event of the evening. NXT champion Bo Dallas and Sami Zayn taking on Antonio Cesaro and the mercenary Leo Kruger. So this match was really good, too. It's a good ending. Good ending of the show. Good final match for the show. So Kruger with a snap suplex. On Sami Zayn for a two count, and that's all right there. Tagging to Cesaro. Cesaro comes in with a Swiss uppercut, one, two, and a kick out. Locks in a chin lock, which William Regal actually calls on commentary as the cranial crack. I think it made sense, more sense to call it the cranial crank, but who, you, who are you to doubt William Regal? Who am I to doubt William Regal? So he punches out of it, and tagging to Leo Kruger, he headbutts him. And a leaping knee drop, one, two, and a kick out from Zayn. So a chin lock again, and this time he punches out of it. Sunset flip, one, two, and a kick out. So Kruger da drags Zayn to the corner. And tagging to Cesaro, they wishbone him. And whip in, and those rapid forearms in the corner from Cesaro. He comes back in, and he power bombs him, one, two, and a kick out. Tagging to Kruger. Kruger with a double boot stomp, and then he does another one. And he puts the knee on the back of the neck, and he pretty much leaves it there to add more pressure. It rolls him over one, two, and a kick out. So he tags Cesaro in. He puts a rear chin lock locked on with the knee firmly planted between the shoulder blades, trying to get the submission. So 
a kick to Cesaro, kind of like a Yakuza kick, basically, tag in to Leo Kruger, and a forward roll by Zayn. Instead of going for a pinfall attempt, he tags in Bo Dallas to the uh, booze of the crowd. So, a flying forearm off the ropes, and a gut shot, and a clothesline off the ropes, and the bow dog out of the corner for 1-2 and a kick out with Cesaro making the save right at the uh, three count. So he, Zane clotheslines him over the top rope to the floor, and they brawl on the floor, and they brawl up the ramp, and they brawl to the back. So obviously we have not seen the last of Antonio Cesaro and Sami Zayn, and that, my friends, is a good thing. It's not next week, obviously. It's the week after on NXT they're going to have their singles match, another singles match between the two of them. And these two are amazing in the ring together. Tremendous chemistry, so it's going to be an awesome match. Like the tag team match was here on NXT tonight. So Kruger gets caught off the ropes with a belly to bow, and he charges in. He catches in both knees in the face, and Bo is staggered. Kruger comes off with the slice, makes the cover in the middle of the ring, one, two, three. So, that is our NXT program for this evening. And next week, oh, next week's going to be awesome. Next week, we've got the dance battle between Summer Rae and Emma. We have the United States title match between Dean Ambrose putting the championship on the line against the man that gravity forgot in Adrian Neville, one half of the NXT Tag Team Champions. And finally, we have the match we've been waiting for, Bo Dallas against Leo Kruger, and I'm not aware if it is for the NXT Championship, but I'm going to guess it probably is, even though it wasn't announced. If it wasn't announced, I'm thinking it might be a non-title match to build towards Kruger and Dallas for the NXT Championship. I know it does happen because I know what happens in it. So, we've got that to look forward to. Uh, good NXT. Very enjoyable show. I like Enzo Amore and uh, Colin Cassidy together. I think they work pretty well as a uh, very low mid-card, almost opening uh, talent spot. I don't mind them. Their feud with Mason Ryan's fine. I don't have a problem with it. Um, if they're going to go in this direction, get Enzo, and Amor Enzo Amore and Big Cass a another person to go with this group... And put them in a six-man against Tons of Funk and Mason Ryan. And do that match for NXT. And I think they should do that for NXT. Oh, yeah. I forgot to mention, before I go any further, there was actually a vignette with Tyler Breeze. Tyler Breeze basically talking about how gorgeous he is and taking more photos with his iPhone. And, oh, yeah. Obviously, once again, people are watching Sir Owen Disney's videos because this week... The Otter Box that I currently own was not on the iPhone this time. Oh no, it was not on there. But I'm guessing he only had the Otter Box on for his match in case he dropped the iPhone accidentally. Then, of course, it wouldn't break it. And, of course, he was just taking selfies in the back and he wasn't afraid about getting hit. So, needless to say, he did not have any need for the Otter Box. Even though, personally, I leave it on all the time because I never know when I'm going to drop the thing because I treat it like it's a baby. Pretty much because... It's my precious, and I don't want anything to happen to my awesome smartphone that I waited oh so long to have. So we get Paige pretty much is the uh, NXT Women's Champion, and she is out to face any and all comers, including the winner of the Summer Ray emma battle. Even though it's going to be a dance contest or a dance battle in this case, I'm guessing we're going to see... Page against the winner or the loser somewhere down the road. Either way, it's probably going to happen. Charlotte has another match, and this was all right for what it was. Uh, Charlotte's taking a while to grow on me. The gymnastics stuff is okay. I still think she needs better gear. She looks like a fitness model. I know that's pretty much the gimmick, but still. Wyatt Family have their last hurrah in NXT, and they go out as baby faces, and they destroy uh, Aiden English and Mickey Keegan, even though Mickey Keegan didn't see anything except for... Uh, the fans and uh, everything from the outside looking in, because obviously he never got tagged in. So that kind of works in this case. Aiden English, of course, eats the pen again, and uh, Bray Wyatt goes out with an awesome promo that I c tried to cut earlier. Corey Graves and Scott Dawson, they had a match. Basically, it was kind of a revenge match because uh, Dawson and Garrett Dillon jumped the tag team champions 
And uh, this is basically just revenge. So that's why Corey Graves had this match with uh, Scott Dawson. I like Dawson. I know they throw this around, this term around a lot. William Regal does it constantly. Throwback. He's definitely a reminiscent of an Anderson, without any question. From the boots down to the way he works in the ring, he's very old school in every single way possible. He is very old school in the way he does moves, the way he has ring psychology. I like this gimmick a lot. And now that the Wyatt family have moved on to Greener Pastures, they're going to be Dylan and Dawson probably getting shots against Graves and Neville somewhere down the road. Even though it seems like that Connor O'Brien and Rick Victor of the Ascension definitely are going to get tag team title shots sooner rather than later. So, the Shield showing up is rather interesting. And they have targeted the NXT Tag Team Champions. Basically, Dean Ambrose says that Adrian Neville's a crook. He just was an opportunist who was in the right place in the right time when Cassius Arno got hurt by the Wyatt family. Basically, he had to slide in and take his spot, and that's how he became a tag team champion. So, this is punishment. Is pretty much what Ambrose is going to deal out, or going to try to deal out next week on NXT. I have a problem with that, because that way we get Adrian Neville and Dean Ambrose in a singles match. That is going to be incredible. The main event was really good, and Leo Kruger needed to get the pin leading towards his match with Bo Dallas next week. Um, crowd really still hates Bo Dallas. So, I mean, Cena's pretty much lost almost all of his fans, too. Even the children are kind of chanting yes, yes, yes at this point, and I like that because that's how it works because obviously we're going to turn John Cena heel thanks to Vince McMahon. But we're going to talk about that in Smack. Actually, I won't talk about that in SmackDown. I'll talk about that on Raw video on uh, Monday night. So uh, that was NXT, and uh, good show. Good show as always. If you're not watching NXT, you need to be. Find it out any way you can. Uh, Hulu Plus, uh, I know it's on Bright House Cable if you're luckily lucky enough to live in Orlando. And uh, you can also check it out. It's not available on television in the U.S., except for obviously Bright House because it's local television. But it is available in other countries, so you can check it out on in the U.K., in Canada, in pretty much anywhere except the United States. So there's always that. I really hope NXT actually gets brought to a time slot on television somewhere. I mean, you could put it on Sci-Fi, you can put it on Spike. Doesn't matter. I don't care how we get it. I want NXT available on television. So, there's always that. Well, this leads us into SmackDown, which just ended about 45 minutes ago. I'll be totally honest with you guys on that one. So, we started the show off with Alberto Del Rio coming out and the World Heavyweight Champion is happy to know he's getting the same courtesy from the SmackDown general manager, Vicky Guerrero, as John Cena got with the Raw general manager, Brad Maddox, basically being able to pick his SummerSlam opponent. So he comes out and he basically thanks Vicky for letting him choose his opponent. And unlike John Cena, who, quote-unquote, wasted his opportunity on that troll Daniel Bryan, and Cena must be afraid of Alberto Del Rio. So he picks a couple names. He drops a couple names. And we're in Houston, Texas, by the way. He drops a couple names and he goes, Well, why doesn't he face off against the beast Brock Lesnar? And he's like, Well, he had a different uh, agenda for SummerSlam. So obviously, it's not going to be him. So why don't I go crazy loco and give a shot to. Houston's own Booker T, and the fans go crazy for it, and he's like, well, like Houston, Booker is a big disappointment. So, Alberto Del Rio decided to choose in his own right a great performer and athlete. The perfect opponent, if you will. The man who's getting his first opportunity to be a world heavyweight champion, and he chooses Ricardo Rodriguez. Now, Ricardo can wrestle, obviously we know this, but, yeah. Basically making a mockery of Vicky letting him pick his opponent. So Vicky calls him out on it. Excuse me. Excuse me. About 75 times. Vicky comes out and says, you're trying to disrespect me? Daniel Bryan is a worthy competitor. You name Ricardo, who is, quote, a jiggly little man-child. They say a bunch of stuff in Spanish that goes over my head, obviously, because Soro and Disney did not have to take any foreign languages in high school. So this is totally lost on me. So, if you want a multilingual video, you're not going to get it here because I don't know what they were saying. Um, basically, Vicky, don't be mad. I can pick someone else right here, right now, like 
How about the Brooklyn Brawler? And I'm sure Steve Lombardi probably would love getting a World Heavyweight title shot, but that was not to be as well. So she's like, I anticipated you pull something like this. And how about we do this my way? And at SummerSlam, you will face the winner of our main event this evening, which will be a triple threat match between the following three superstars, Rob Van Dam, Christian, and Randy Orton. And that's our main event, the three-way between Orton, Van Dam, and Christian. So that's going to be an awesome match, and it was an awesome match, but I'll talk about that in a minute. We got our first match of the evening, and uh, again, I thought this match would go a lot longer, but I should have known better, and I didn't get any notes on this match. I'll just do the finish. I like the way the finish was done, too. It was Cody Rhodes against Jack Swagger, and uh, basically, Swagger goes for the Gut Ridge Powerbomb, and he picks him up, and he counters in midair into a sunset flip, one, two, three, and the match ends, so Cody wins. After the match is over, Cody gets jumped from behind, and he basically slams his head into this like box container type deal over and over again, Sandow getting the last laugh. So obviously, he's still a little bit peeved that he had to swim in the uh, Gulf of Mexico for the Money in the Bank briefcase on Raw Monday night. I'd be a little peeved too, because obviously, I can't swim. And neither apparently can uh, Sandow, because there was a very well-placed ladder that was very close to where Sandow jumped into the water, in case obviously he could not make it out. More than just dog paddle, which is kind of how Sorrow and Disney swims. So, uh, there's actually a video on YouTube about me swimming, but the, you're going to have to find it. Because, obviously, yeah. So, we get a match next with Sin Cara coming out. And Sin Cara is taking on another former NXT champion in Big E Langston. Langston, of course, not flanked by AJ Lee this time. He comes out by himself. He does the old chalk. He does... Comes out to I Got Five. He's doing the same thing he did as a baby face in NXT. But obviously he's a heel in the WWE. So a whip in, ducks the clothesline, toss him up in the air, and an insigiri kick on Biggie Langston, one, two, and a kick out. Langston gets na nails him with a big back body drop and a clothesline into an abdominal stretch. which was an interesting maneuver for Langston to pull out of his repertoire. He grabs the ropes while the referee is checking on Sin Cara to see if he's going to give it up. And, of course, the referee catches him. And, of course... In the immortal words of Brian Danielson, back off ref, I got five, and he does, pun intended, and he breaks the hold, obviously, before he gets disqualified. So a step-up kick on the ring apron, staggers Langston, goes for a springboard, gets caught, turn around into the big ending, and he gets countered, and he goes for a quebrada moonsault, but when he lands on Big E, Big E uses the opportunity to plant him with the big ending and win the match, so that was the end of the match. So, this is rather interesting, too, to be totally honest. On last week, we had CM Punk come out on SmackDown, and he was basically saying he is going for Brock Lesnar. He's going to try to cut his head off. Not, not literally, of course. It's not going to be like Jones and Natural Born Killers. Oh, no. And it's not Brazil, either. No offense. But, topical. So... He's basically just going to try to destroy Brock Lesnar and therefore end up destroying Paul Heyman by destroying Brock Lesnar. So what happens? He gets interrupted by Fandango and the vivacious Summer Rae. So they dance and they dance. Fandango gets in the ring before he can do it. It's Fandango's spot. He gets nailed with a microphone by Punk. Punk beats him to a pulp, nails to go to sleep, and that's the end of that segment. So we get this match between Fandango and CM Punk. And I'll tell you right now, for those of you out there that don't think that Fandango can go in the ring, number one, you're blind, and number two, you're misinformed. Look past the gimmick. This is going out to you, Will. Look past the gimmick. And no, it's not that bad of a gimmick. Look past the gimmick, and Fandango is a very serviceable, very well-rounded athlete and a great wrestler. And he hung up with Punk, like, from bell to bell. I very much enjoyed this match. I knew Fandango was not going to win, but I knew he was going to put up a quite a fight for Punk, even more so than people would give him credit for. And he did just that. So we go midway through the match, as we usually do. Punk with a leg lariat, and he goes for go to sleep. It gets countered. Fandango smartly slides under the bottom rope, powders to the floor to breaks up the momentum. That makes total sense. He's been doing this a lot lately. He did this against Van Damme. 
on Raw Monday night, and of course he took the countout loss instead of losing to Van Dam. So he didn't really have to get pinned in this match. That match, obviously. And he puts Summer Rae in front of him, and she distracts him long enough for Fandango to send Punk hard into the steel ring steps. Fandango rolls back in. As the referee continues the count, they get to eight. Punk kind of like stumbles up to his feet, dives in at nine, and breaks the count. So Fandango almost won this by count out. Whip in high velocity style, so like this the whip that sends him chest first in the buckle, and then Fandango does it again. So locks in a chin lock. Punk punches out of it, and a sunset flip by Punk is broken by an Eddie Guerrero style spinning boot scrape which I loved. I thought it looked awesome. One, two, and a kick out. So a chin lock by Fondongo, Punk elbows out of it, and then the whip in and a boot to the face. One, two, and a kick out. So he goes for the middle rope knee drop, so he gets overzealous. He feels like he's going to finish off Punk. Punk's out of the way, and Punk nails his spinning neck breaker off the ropes. And, of course, ends up getting the running knee strike in the corner into the short arm clothesline. He goes up top predictably for the Randy Savage elbow, and Fondongo again breaks momentum by going to the floor. So, Fondongo is on the floor at this point. Punk gets back in. He ducks his head through the ropes, and like everyone before him, Fondongo leaps up and high kicks him in the back of the head. So, basically, Punk is down. He gets in the ring. He plants Punk with a falcon arrow, and almost gets the pin right there. So he gets two and three quarters right there. Punk barely kicks out. So he goes up top, preferably going for the perfect ten, which is the guillotine leg drop off the top. And he gets crotched on top by Punk. And Punk climbs up. And Punk goes for the superplex. And Punk lands it. And he floats over. And instead of floating over for the pin, he hooks the arm, he hooks the neck, and he locks Fondongo into the Anaconda device. And Fondongo taps immediately. Punk wins this match, and not a one-sided match at all. Definitely not a squash, not even a glorified squash. This match was very even between these two. And it's kind of like on NXT last week when they had Sheamus against Luke Harper. On paper, it doesn't really look like it would be much of a challenge. Kind of like Fondango didn't look like he'd be much of a challenge to Punk. But in both cases, they stuck with the more established superstar. Not to take anything away from Luke Harper and his independent reign as a big rig Brody Lee, or not to take anything away from Fondongo and his matches as Johnny Curtis in the past. Basically, they hung with the uh, the upper echelon talent, and I liked it that way. That was awesome, and this match really delivered, and I was very happy to see what they do with Fondongo down the road. I honestly think that if he would not have gotten injured, if he would not have gotten that concussion, I think guarantee you without question, Fondongo would have won Money in the Bank. And we'd be seeing Fondongo against Alberto Del Rio, or Fondongo against Dolph Ziggler, or Fondongo against whomever is going to win this three-way, or even Damian Sandow, or whomever would be the World Heavyweight Champion at this point, if that were not the case. But unfortunately, because Fondongo was injured and he was concussed, they didn't take the risk right there, but I honestly think that with the push they're giving him, sooner rather than later, Fondongo is going to get his. As in, he's going to get a title. He will have a championship before 2013 is over. That's a guarantee. Actually, I'll go out on a limb and say, before we go to SmackDown on October 8th, Fondongo will be a champion. I don't know what championship, but he will be a champion. I'm not sure if it will be face or heel, but he will be a champion. And he deserves to be because he's putting on some great matches right now. Like him or hate him, he can go. So we get our next matchup, which by virtue of the pinfall that Caitlyn got on Raw over the Divas champion AJ Lee, she gets a title opportunity tonight on SmackDown. So Divas Championship on the line next. Caitlyn with Layla, dressed in all black. Hmm, foreshadowing maybe? We'll find out in a second. Taking on AJ Lee, and of course... Apparently, both Raw and SmackDown general managers, Brad Maddox and Vicky Guerrero, respectively, have decided that Biggie Langston's a little too, I don't know, ominous and a little too threatening. 
So he's not going to be allowed to be at ringside for AJ's title defenses any longer. Or even after AJ loses the championship, which he predictably will lose sooner rather than later probably. I would say that that's going to continue. So we get this match. And nice spinning heel kick by the Divas champion. And Caitlyn goes down. She comes off the ropes. Caitlyn catches her with a drop kick. So he goes for the fireman's gut buster. And uh, basically, it's more, it's kind of like almost like go to sleep the way that she landed it. But AJ gets knocked for a loop and her momentum carries her to the floor. So Caitlyn goes out and she basically has AJ against the barricade. Like she's going to spear her probably through the barricade, which would be awesome if it actually happened. But Layla gets in the way and puts the thinking cap or the uh, duh sticker that we I've been calling for months now, and everyone on the internet obviously has been saying it too, that Layla was going to turn heel on Caitlyn, and another friend of Caitlyn will stab her in the back. It doesn't pay to be a female friend of Caitlyn, unless you like secretly don't like her and you're just trying to uh, use her for whatever gain you can get from her. I don't know what Kay Layla got out of this, but... We'll get to that in a second. Goes for the spear, and Layla jumps in the way, allowing AJ to uh, get her wits about herself, and she basically throws her into the barricade, tosses her back into the ring, into the satellite head scissors, into the Black Widow, right in the center of the ring, and the tap out. So, after the match is over, we get the recap of the match, and you see Layla and AJ skipping around the ringside area, hand in hand, and they hug at the top of the ramp, and Caitlyn, once again, has lost a friend. Does not pay to be a female friend of Caitlyn. Once again, we're building towards more. I would say Caitlyn and Layla will probably battle on Raw or SmackDown this week. I would say that's probably an inevitability right now. I think that you're going to get Caitlyn and AJ in a stipulation match of some sort. Now, I know Vince has pretty much said, went on record, even though it's off the record, He's basically said behind closed doors he wants this to be his answer to the tremendous knockouts matches that Terrence Terrell and Gail Kim were having on TNA. So in order to go to that level, they're going to have to do a stipulation match at SummerSlam. And this is where Caitlyn wins the championship. I think Caitlyn wins the Divas Championship at SummerSlam in a stipulation match against AJ. <clears throat> And then, of course, she goes on to wherever you want to go that direction there. Obviously, with Total Divas, we're going to start building up the Bellas again. Or, I guess, building up... Well, I guess you'll build the Bellas up again, to be totally honest. So, who knows what's going to happen with Total Divas. Oh, yeah, by the way, check it out at uh, 10 o'clock on uh, E-Network on Sunday. You can actually check it out uh, tomorrow. So, yeah. There's always that. So we get our main event in the evening, and what a main event this match was. Uh, about 20 minutes live action. Number one contenders match for Alberta Del Rio's World Heavyweight Championship. The title opportunity at SummerSlam. Rob Van Dam, Christian, and Randy Orton. So we go midway through the match, like we do here on Pop. And Christian nails a Tornado DDT on Van Dam, spikes him like an exclamation point, and of course that's not the first time, This that's only the first time in this match that that actually happens. Van Dam is the greatest in the world about selling on his head. He gets tremendous height when he sells on his head, and it looks absolutely devastating when he lands. So Orton with the with the St. Louis uppercut, pounds away on Christian, and a Luthez press, and Christian catches him with a back elbow. He goes up top, he gets caught, they trade blows, Orton climbs up, and in sheer Orton fashion, given the fact his name is Orton after all, and of course it's in his blood to do the superplex, given the fact that it is his father, Cowboy Bob Orton's finisher, he plants Christian with the superplex. One, two, and a kick out. So Van Dam comes in, hits a clothesline on both men. Orton goes for a kick. Of course, you don't kick Rob Van Dam, just like you don't powerbomb Billy Kidman. And what happens is it gets countered, step over into a spinning wheel kick on Randy Orton, and front forward roll and a monkey flip on Christian out of the corner. A wheel kick on Randy Orton, and a front slam on Orton. Split-legged moonsault on Randy Orton. One, two, and Orton kicks out. So, two shoulders in the midsection. Backflip, charges in. Orton catches him with a knee into the head. Goes to the snake bite DDT. It gets countered this time. Orton gets tossed to the floor. And Van Dam charges in. And Christian 
alley oops that sends him over the top rope to the floor, like backdrops him over the top rope to the floor. So Orton's on the floor. Christian dives and nails a baseball slide drop kick on Randy Orton and slams him on the floor. Christian ends up getting slammed on the floor by Van Dam. So Van Dam gets in the ring, and of course, he's going to fly, folks. He's definitely going to fly. Van Dam charges in, nails the Tope Cone Hilo on both men on the floor, and of course, we go to commercial break on that. So Orton and Christian, one, two, oh, sorry, they trade blows, and a high back body drop. He charges in, Christian dives off the middle rope, and he gets caught, jackknife cover, 1-2, and a kick out, countered into a pinfall attempt, 1-2, and a kick out from Christian. So he goes for the spear. Orton has a telegraph since, of course, Randy Orton and Christian had 4,000 matches a couple years ago. So obviously he has his telegraph. He leapfrogs over the spear, and Christian ends up going off the middle rope, catching him with a spinning back elbow, goes for the kill switch. It gets countered, shoved off, duck in, high kick on Randy Orton, Rolls up Van Dam, one, two, and a kick out. So, a kick to the face of Christian. Basically, the ricochet kick where he kicks the turnbuckle and it, like, goes back into the face. So, Christian goes down. <clears throat> Van Dam climbs the top rope. Five-star frog splash. One, two, and Orton valiantly makes the save. Goes with a ten punch in the corner on Van Dam. So, he whips in reverse, and he gets countered. Vintage Orton. Clothesline, clothesline. Duck the opponent's clothesline. And instead of the Samoa Joe snap power slam, he gets countered right here. Van Dam goes for rolling thunder. And when Van Dam flips, Orton gets up to his feet. And Samoa Joe snap power slam. One, two, and a kick out. So, Christian is in trouble. As your Christian goes to attack, he's on the ring apron, he gets caught. Orton catches him with a snake by DDT, it gets countered. Slingshot, it gets countered into a drop kick, sends him to the floor. So basically, he tries to slingshot himself in. Orton catches him with the Pillman counter, and basically, in this case, it's not him diving off the top rope. He's basically just countering him, diving into the ring, and he drop kicks him, sends him to the floor. So he goes for the kill switch. It gets countered. Snake bite DDT, Van Dam comes in, eats the RKO. Orton goes for an RKO on Christian. It gets countered in a backslide. One, two, three. And obviously... WrestlingFigs.com rejoices as Ringsider Riot rejoices 100% as Christian becomes the number one contender to Alberto Del Rio's World Heavyweight Championship at SummerSlam. So Christian is being interviewed, and he's about ready to celebrate, and bam, out of nowhere, Del Rio attacks and plants him with the GSK, and leaves Christian Lang, and he stands tall to end the show. So, good addition to SmackDown, very enjoyable. Cody Rhodes' babyface push still continues, and he beats Jack Swagger with a very unique finish. I very much enjoyed that. Sandow jumps in from behind to get his heat back. I got no problems with that. We're obviously leading towards Sandow and Rhodes with the briefcase on the line at SummerSlam. And I think Cody Rhodes is going to beat Sandow and take the case. So, you have Biggie Langston squashes Sin Cara. Punk and Fandango had a tremendous match. And I really, really want to see where they go with this. Uh, the singles push of Fandango continues. A push proving you don't have to necessarily win to get yourself over. It was really good. He even looked great in defeat. And he hung with Punk the whole time. So I'm obviously a giant Fandango fan. And I'm a huge Fandango supporter. But when it comes down to it, this match was great. Really good match. Uh, AJ gets the one up on Caitlyn. And we see the long-awaited heel turn of Layla L. As she becomes the new BFF of the Divas Champion. The cute and crazy AJ Lee. So Caitlyn once again gets bitten by her best friend. Sucks to be Caitlyn right now. But, of course, she's going to get the uh, championship back at SummerSlam, so no worries. No need to worry for Caitlyn. Or we might get, she might win it at Battleground or Night of Champions. It could go either way. Maybe Night of Champions. She might, AJ might win at SummerSlam or, no, I think Caitlyn wins at SummerSlam. AJ and Caitlyn have a rematch at Night of Champions, and uh, we Maybe we blow it off a Survivor Series, potentially. I don't think it's going to go that long, but I don't know. Caitlyn does not have a female friend right now. Hmm. 
There's someone on NXT right now that just got a championship that would be really good in this spot. And she probably would be really good in knowing how to handle someone who's crazy. But Paige just got the NXT Women's Championship, so I don't think she's getting brought up to the main roster just yet. But that would be the perfect person for Caitlyn to team up with against AJ and Layla, and I think that'd be a great idea. So we had a great main event, tremendous finish of the match. I very much enjoyed the Rolling Thunder into the Snap Power Slam. That was awesome. I like the, I love the finish of the match with Orton going for the RKO. He plants Van Dam like an exclamation point. And he goes to do it on Christian, since, of course, like I told you, the 7 million matches Christian and Randy Orton had a couple years ago. Notwithstanding, he knew how to counter it. He does counter it into a backslide, of all things, 1-2-3. And then Del Rio gets his heat back by G.S. Kang. Orton, sorry, Christian into next week. So that was the end of SmackDown. So, great video tonight. So hopefully you enjoyed the video. <clears throat> You'll see my bright, smiling face on Monday when we're going to talk Raw. Of course, Thursday we're going to talk TNA Impact, and uh, if you want to check out my Impact recap from this past week, you can check out that on the uh, Pop playlist, as well as today we have the Summer of Tarantino talking about the Kill Bill saga, and yesterday AJ's weekend movie reviews of Smurfs 2, Two Guns, Disconnect, Much Ado About Nothing, Magic Magic, and 20 Feet from Stardom, so a big six video Six movie video from that AJ and I shot earlier this week, so it was really good, really enjoyable stuff. Very happy that you guys enjoyed the videos. If you do enjoy the videos, tell your friends about them. Do leave a comment. We don't get many comments here on Pop, but we do appreciate the few and far between ones we do get, so thank you out there for watching. Thank you for subscribing. If you like these videos, subscribe to them. You can share them on your social medias, Twitter, Facebook, doesn't matter. Get the word out about Pop and the Popcaster Revolution if you want to be part of it. You're more than welcome to send me an email at Disney at gmail.com, or you can tweet me at, literally, at the, amp, the at symbol Suro and Disney on Twitter, and you also can uh, get a hold of me any way you want on Facebook, you can, it's Owen Disney, find me any way you want, and uh, let us know what you think about these videos. We're going to continue to do them, because obviously you guys and girls out there definitely love them, love to watch them, so somebody out there cares, and that's all that matters. So thank you out there for watching, and obviously since we're doing the time travel thing, I probably had a really long day at work today, hopefully I got to build Percy Jackson a 10 cup at work today. Who knows if I will, if I did or not. Probably enjoyed my awesome McDonald's I had, depending on when you watch this video. And I got to work with Will and Molly, so that's always fun. And probably some really cool kids, too. And maybe some others that I don't really talk to. Who knows? Just depends. And uh, thank you guys out there for watching. And, of course, you can also check out Versus tomorrow, which, like I said, the cryptic clue is reality. So you can hopefully uh, divulge what that is going to be. That's going to be tomorrow's video. So until Monday, you won't see me again until Monday, but until tomorrow, boys and girls, that's all I got to say about that.